first of all, you got to know what your superpowers are as a company or law firm. You got to know like what allows you to stand out from everybody else. And then you got to share it a bunch of times everywhere as much as possible. That's Pat Flynn, entrepreneur, marketing expert, and best-selling author of Superfans. If you keep changing the language, if you keep changing your target audience, if you keep changing what it is you say, how in the heck are people gonna just understand that you are that person to help on that certain thing? I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Pat Flynn to discuss how to convert a casual audience into super fans of your brand, why you should do things that aren't scalable, and why there's no substitute for genuine human connection. When was the last time you reached out to maybe a client that you hadn't spoke to in a while or, or you know, from a case maybe a year or two ago? Like, reach out, just say, see how they're doing with literally no agenda than, than just to see how they're doing. Because when you keep those relationships open, what you're doing is you're digging your well before you're thirsty. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Pat Flynn is an entrepreneur who owns several successful online businesses, is a professional blogger, keynote speaker, and the best-selling author of several books, including Superfans, The Easy Way to Stand Out, Grow Your Tribe, and Build a Successful Business. I began our conversation by asking Pat what motivated him to write this book. It actually came from uh, my most popular presentation that I had been giving. I've been speaking on stage since 2011, and in 2014 in Las Vegas at an event called New Media Expo, Uh, I spoke on this topic because I knew that many people were focusing, at least in the space I was in, on things like search engine optimization and building all this traffic. And what was unfortunate about that, I mean, it's important to do that, but oftentimes that was the end game for people was let's just get more traffic and make sales. And I always knew that, well, what if that was the beginning of a relationship and a much further long-term relationship that you could have with with a customer uh, who could become a lifelong customer, but not just a lifelong customer, somebody who could also promote your brand for you and uh, you know a part of your marketing team, if you will, without you even having to pay them if they just love your stuff so much, much like how we do with stuff that we love, music and movies and whatnot, we share it just because we love it so much. What if people did that with our brands? And so I gave this presentation on stage in 2014 and it had such a massive response that I was actually asked to speak on the same topic over a dozen times in the next couple of years from different events all over the world, including Australia. And then a good friend of mine, Jay Bear, who has written several books as well, including one called Hug Your Haters, uh, which I highly recommend. He came up to me after I presented about this topic. He was in the audience and he was like, Pat, that was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. This needs to be a book. And I was like, oh man, I've done the book thing before. It's you know hard and I'm just gonna keep speaking. But you know what? Speaking can only take you so far. It can only get you in front of so many people. And so in 2019, I ended up writing this book, uh, actually within a month, um, in November of 2019, this book was written in a month because November is called NaNoWriMo in the writer's world. It's National Novel Writers Month and people challenge themselves to write an entire book in November. I didn't finish quite in one month, but I finished on my birthday, December 6th. And then it was in the team's hands. We got it out uh, in 2020. No, actually, November 2018 was when it was written. It was released in 2019. And it's just been taken off. And although it didn't hit any lists like my other books have, this one just continues to shoot forward. And I think it's so perfect right now as far as what people need to hear and the fact that, well, we need to provide people experiences that they could want to come back to and also share. And this is how I think people should be growing their brands and I think we all can feel like community is really a part of the future of what will make a business successful. So it's interesting. So I read the book when it came out and then I reread the book recently. And I don't know if this has surprised you, but it's amazing how much the concepts have held up and become even more important now than perhaps they were even a couple of years ago. And much of the conversation really talks about like quality versus quantity. Mm -hmm. And there's several ways to grow a business, but what what are your thoughts? I mean, why such an advocacy on quality? Like, is, is it really the best way to scale? I think so, for sure. I mean, you want both, right? You want 
a lot of really good things and that's ideal. But I think that if you just start with quality, the quantity will come, right? Whenever you create good content, Google will eventually rank it at the top of Google and people will find it and share it and people will talk about it because it's so good quality, right? You could have a thousand YouTube videos out on your YouTube channel and they could all be not so great and you'll get hardly any subscribers. Sometimes you can have one or two videos that are amazing that help you gain millions of views, right? So I, I, I'm definitely more of a quality game. And a lot of this ties back into something that I once heard Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk talk about, and this was called small town rules. And what small town rules is, if you remember, well, I don't remember, but like way back in the day, uh, let's say, you know, early 1900s or late 1800s, right? With small towns, you kind of knew everybody who was in the city and in the town that you were in and you built relationships with them. You would go to Bob's Bakery because not just they had really good bread, but because when you walked in, Bob would greet you and they would ask you how your kids were doing and how's the soccer game this past weekend or whatever. And it felt really special, so special that if a new grocery store chain opened up between you and Bob's Bakery, you would still trek a little bit further to go to Bob because you have that relationship with Bob and then you know about their family and they know about you. And this is the kind of thing that I think social media and online has always had the opportunity to do, but I think we've been trying to scale too fast and automate everything. And we just forgot about the fact that there are actual human beings on the other end who, if you just make them feel special, if you paid a little bit of attention to them, they're gonna wanna continue to come back, but also share what you have uh, as well. And like you were saying, you don't need a lot in order for great things to happen. I was inspired, in in fact, to write this book and actually do my presentation initially from an article that was written in 2005 or 2006 by a man named Kevin Kelly. He's a senior editor of Wired Magazine, and he wrote a very famous article called A Thousand True Fans. And this article was more of a piece for artists and musicians, but also entrepreneurs as well, that basically said, well, you don't need a blockbuster hit to do really well. You don't need a million subscribers. You don't need a million views on anything. You just need to try to get a thousand true fans, a true fan being somebody who, you know, if you're a musician, they're going to drive eight hours to see your set and then wait for you backstage to, you know, get your autograph. Or if you have a product that comes out, they're not even going to read the sales page. They're going to buy it because they've already gotten to know you and what you have to offer. If you have a thousand of those, for example, and they are paying you a hundred dollars a year for your art, your craft, your goods, whatever it might be. And that's not very much, you know, when we're fans of something, we'll sometimes spend way too much on things, right? A thousand people times a hundred dollars a year is already a six figure business for just a thousand people. And to put that into perspective, that's one fan a day for less than three years. And people are spending, you know, decades trying to build a business where what if you just focus on those experiences one a day for one person and build those fan bases? I mean, it could do really well for you and 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 then you can grow the business from the inside. And and to give our listeners some context around like what is a super fan? I know in the book you talk about this like pyramid of fandom. Yeah. What what are some of the levels of that pyramid? What's the difference between like a casual audience versus a super fan? Yeah, I mean, when you hear a great song on the radio, right, and you don't know who the band is, you're not immediately a super fan of that band, right? You're just like, oh, that's kind of a cool song. And so what that is is sort of your casual audience, people who sort of just hear you or, or see you or read about you for the first time. It might be a link from a, another website. It might be a social tweet that was retweeted or something, but they don't really know who you are. This is your casual audience in the base of your pyramid, the largest portion of it. And when you spend money on traffic, when you have search engine optimization, I mean, that's where people are coming in. They're coming in from the bottom. And then what we wanna do is convert them into a super fan, but it doesn't happen right away. It takes time, right? People are not fans of the moment people find you. They're fans because of the moments that you create for them over time. So from casual audience, which was at the bottom, you wanna convert them into an active audience member or somebody who's, for example, a subscriber or they're engaged in some way and they're communicating with you and you're communicating with them and that's really cool. And uh, they're following you on social media and they kinda know what you have going on and when you create something or you come out with something or publish something, they already have a basis for what it is that they might get and they make a decision, okay, yeah, I'll buy that or yeah, I'll take the time to read that from there. Now, they're not fans yet. We need to convert them from active audience member to become a part of the community. And the community is really cool because it's not just you talking to them and them talking to you anymore. It's them talking to and finding each other, right? It's when you are at your home team's baseball game and you're down three runs in the ninth inning and a guy hits a grand slam and you win the game, right? You're high-fiving people who you don't even know because you're all wearing the same color ball cap, right? And that's, that's what happens when a community comes together all for the benefit of their brand that they're following, their team. And you could be sort of that person, brand, company that everybody roots for because they are finding each other within that as well. It's where you get 
a lot of these musicians have fan groups, right? And they have names for these fan groups. They almost kind of create an identity of becoming a fan of, you know, Taylor Swift. Oh, you're a Swifty too, or you're a Belieber, that's Justin Bieber, or a One Direction, or, you know, you can name them all. And in fact, a lot of podcasters I know have fans that have names for themselves, right? Fire Nation with John Lee Dumas, and even my tribe, if you will, uh, has, has dubbed themselves Team Flynn, right? They're on Team Flynn. I'm the team captain, but we're all kind of winning and losing together. So that's really cool what happens in a community. And then sometimes those people will naturally just become super fans because they've gotten to almost habitually consume what it is you have to offer. But there are some things you can do at the top of that pyramid to help those community members, you know, nudge them into super fan status a little bit, which I talk about in the book. So, so for people listening, let's say you're a law firm owner, and I, I always like to address the skeptic, right? They're, they're hearing this, they're hearing about Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift, and let's say they're not Justin Bieber or you know Taylor Swift. Is this possible? Is this idea of creating these super fans, is it also possible for businesses like professional service businesses, and maybe ones that are not as exciting as Taylor Swift, for example, or at least believe that they may not be as exciting? Right. Uh, I would probably beg to differ, but have you seen <laughs> this play out in, in those types of organizations? Well, you don't need to write a hit song and, you know, have a stadium full of people who just drool over every word in order to have fans, right? You don't have to create hit songs. When I started my online business, it was actually in the architecture world. I actually got laid off from my architecture firm in 2008 with the Great Recession, and it didn't feel good at the time. It, looking back, was the best thing to ever happen. But when I started my business, I was helping people pass an architectural exam, and I was doing this just on my website. And I remember after a few months, I started getting emails from people who had started to get their test results back after consuming my information. And they were so thankful, they were so grateful. And there was one person in particular, her name, her name was Jackie. She reached out to me and she couldn't believe how easy the test was, even though it was the most difficult test because of my material. And she said she had gotten a raise and a promotion as a result. And she said that she was gonna convince everybody in the office to purchase from me. And I was like, that's really nice of you. And at the, at the end of her email, she said, your biggest fan, Jackie. And I was like, biggest fan, like that doesn't make any sense because I just helped you pass an architectural exam and maybe answered a couple of your emails, but that was it. So I didn't really think much of that until a few months later, what she said came true. Actually, I saw 25 emails all within a week from customers who were all from the same firm that she was in. She had been able to convince the higher ups at her firm to individually buy my guide for every single person that was in the office. And so that one person, Jackie, the fan, of my architectural exam business, super dry, right? Was able to help 25X the returns because of the experience that I gave her, right? So yes, you can definitely do this no matter what kind of business you have, no matter what it is you talk about. And I would imagine that with law, especially with how integrated that is to, you know, what happens in a person's life based on certain decisions that are made or the work that you do for them. I mean, I think even, even more so of a chance for that to happen in here as well. Pat, what are some of the things you've seen? Like, why do we become fans of different brands and different businesses? What what really leads to that, right? Because I mean, for example, anyone that I know that has a Peloton, they're obsessed with Peloton. Same thing goes with like Apple products. I once heard something that like people can't name Tesla. five people in their life that don't own a single Apple product. Tesla, as you mentioned, like what, what leads to this? Is it experiential? Like what, what are some of the components of that? I mean, there's definitely, okay, this company made me feel great, right? And if you're on a Peloton, for example, there's a few things that happen sort of psychologically. I'm not a psychiatrist or anything like that or, or, or a psychologist, but I do know that, number one, you have really good feelings when you finish a workout, right? You have these endorphins, you're feeling really great. And of course, because it's this like magnificent piece in your living room or whatever, you might take a picture and snap a photo of it and then you get positive feedback from your friends who are like, great job, you're doing awesome. So what made that happen? The Peloton, okay, I'm gonna get on the Peloton again and I'm gonna keep sharing that experience. There's also, it's interesting that we mentioned like Apple and Tesla and Peloton, which are like, higher tier, high class sort of products, right? There is something to be said for just the status of what that product can give you, right? And, and, and how that makes you feel. But it doesn't mean you have to create a high end product in order for people to have this. I mean, I know some people who are fans of, there's a brand, for example, of men's shorts, and excuse the name of this, but this is the name of it, it's called Chubbies, is the name of the brand. And they have a massive fan base, and they just sell shorts. But their brand identity is something that people can relate to. Because when you go to their website, it's like a dude with a beard and glasses at the lake with super short shorts with, Amer with the American flag on it, flipping burgers with his friends in the background, chilling, having a great time. And that's like the weekend barbecue guy. These are your shorts that you're gonna get because that's the brand that you can relate to. So I think more than just like the product, it's the feeling. 
And I know in my brand, I try to make people feel like a lot of this stuff is not as overwhelming as it may seem. So they might go elsewhere and go, wow, Pat, you've been able to uh, deconstruct this in a way that allows me to actually be able to start a podcast or to be able to start a business in a way that I never thought was possible for me. I often try to inject small, quick wins, which is a big strategy that anybody can do to allow for people to go, wow, I'm already getting a result here. I need to come back for more, which taps into sort of a person's reptilian part of their brain. And then more than that, I just try to, you know, give people even just a little bit of time and attention to a point where sometimes, and I do this every Friday, I take my dogs on a walk every Friday, I have my phone with me, and I'm just sending direct messages to people who have recently commented on my Instagram post, direct message, so it's not public to just say, hey, thanks, Michael. Thanks for commenting on that latest picture. I hope you're having a great week and I wish you the best weekend ever. And that's it, no agenda whatsoever. And I'll tell you, people's minds are blown. They couldn't believe that I had spent all this time to craft a message when literally it's like 10 seconds in a video. And I'll tell you, that goes a very, very long way. So a question would be for everybody listening is like, when was the last time you reached out to maybe a client that you hadn't spoke to in a while or, or you know, from a case maybe a year or two ago, like reach out, just say, see how they're doing with literally no agenda than, than just to see how they're doing. Because when you keep those relationships open, what you're doing is you're digging your well before you're thirsty. There could be a time in the future where you might need something. And if you don't dig your well, you're, if you're digging your well when you're thirsty, it's already too late. Um, so keeping in touch like that, and giving people just a little bit of time and attention, which people crave, it's human nature, can really go a long way in building your brand and building these super fans. You know, would, I, I imagine this is going to come up a lot as, as we're talking about this stuff. Someone's going to hear the things we're saying and they're going to think, well, how do I scale that? I've got, you know, thousands of clients. I can't be writing everybody a handwritten card or, or calling every single client that we have. And I believe what you're actually presenting is the fact that you don't have to scale at times a thousand because the quality of those connections matters a lot. Like you don't have to message every single person that, you know, that follows you on Instagram, but being able to message some people individually can make a huge impact. Mm -hmm. I think if you are just starting out and you do have the time to answer everybody, do it. I mean, I, I would highly recommend that. There is power in being small, the, the ability for you to have more connections with a larger part of your or audience versus you know a huge brand or a bigger brand in your space who just doesn't have the time to do that. If you're starting out small, small is your advantage for sure. But over time, you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. And the question is, well, do you have to scale everything? I think, I remember sharing this strategy with somebody and they were like, okay, I have a great idea to scale this. I'm like, it, it's just do it. And they're like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna record a video for all the Johns and I'm gonna record a video for all the Britneys, like choosing the, they were like looking up the top 100 names. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, this is taking you more time to research how to do this. And you're gonna have to, it's not gonna be boring for you. It's gonna be, it's not gonna be real versus just pick up the phone. Like I told them to do it. I was like, pick up the phone message that guy right there and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Not, not everything has to be scalable. I think things should be optimized. I think things can be scalable and you know there should be funnels in place in your business and things that are automated or things that software takes care of or things that other people uh, and, and team take care of so that you can focus on what you need to do the most. But in many ways, I think this, this just doesn't have to scale that much. That being said, there are ways, especially in the sort of community sector, to scale this sort of feeling of community and super fandom. For example, one thing I love to do is invite not just like Tim Ferriss and Gary Vaynerchuk and all these other amazing entrepreneurs on my podcast, which is great and those always do really well, but I also love to invite my own students on, people who have, for example, taken my courses or who read a blog post, did the thing and then got a result. I bring them on, I showcase their story, I make them look like the hero. And what does that do? It makes everybody else in the community feel more connected to all the work that we're doing here, right? By just even sharing one person stuff publicly, I am scaling, I am connecting with them, but I'm also bringing these good feelings of people who maybe they're going to reaffirm their decision to work with this brand, or maybe they go, wow, I didn't think I could do it. This person was just like me, they went through the same exact struggles, there's no excuse, I'm gonna do it, right? And so a lot of this sort of community spotlighting could be really great. The ability for you to co-create with your people, with your clients, with your community, have them not necessarily dictate exactly every move the business should make, but there are likely opportunities to get your audience involved and get them engaged and get them interested in what you're doing by saying, hey, you know, we have a decision to make and we wanted to get you involved. You wanna go here or you wanna go there? We've seen big companies do this. We've we've seen, you know, Eminem, not the rapper, but like the candy, go to their audience and go, hey, what should the next flavor be? 
right? Or what, what should the next color of the M&M be? Or Pepsi and Coke have done this. Domino's has gotten their audience involved in this way. Um, but at the small level, it, it's even more powerful because a person can really have a, a true feeling that they're having a direct impact on where the business is going. And, and uh, again, it's like the difference between, I don't know if you remember back in the day, I don't even know if they still exist, but you go to restaurants or a fast food place or whatever, some establishment, and there'd be a comment box with like some cards. And you, if you had a complaint, for example, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna angrily scratch this on here and I'm gonna drop it in there. And what happens, it probably never gets seen or goes to the shredder. Versus nowadays, we have direct access to people and we can allow them to, uh, you know, engage with us and to provide feedback and then we can respond a lot more quickly, right? I think there was a study that was done where, you know, this this is great because it also shows you don't have to always get it right. You could you could actually make mistakes and, and, and that can actually help you get more fans, right? There was a study that was done with hotels that hotels got higher ratings when they made mistakes and solved those problems or had done something incorrect and then stepped up to correct those problems versus just hotels that were just great, like everything worked out perfectly. People really appreciate when somebody or a company sees them and steps up. And of course, when a person, here's my phrase, when a person is involved, they're invested, right? When a person is involved, they're they're gonna be invested. So I am actually going to prove out everything you just said, your concept. I, I didn't know if I was gonna do this, but now I almost feel like I have to because I have a responsibility to. So are you familiar with the company Eight Sleep? The, the, ma the mattress? Yes, yes. I am actually. I have loved Eight Sleep. It, we actually had somebody on the podcast months ago, Matt Frazier, and he was raving about it. And he's like, "Like you got to get an Eight Sleep. It's like this pod that you put over your mattress so you can even buy it all built in. But it does like the heating and cooling and it helps you sleep all night long. It's absolutely amazing. Anyway, I've loved it e ever since. And about you know a year in, I had a leak. This actually just happened like a week ago uh, where the thing started leaking a little bit. And I reached out to Eight Sleep and I was like, look, here's what happened. The CEO responded back and said, look, we're going to we're going to expedite providing the replacement for you. Also, can you send us a picture of the mattress? It was like a water leak. They reimbursed me for the entire cost of my mattress as well. Wow. So it has gone cool. to like another level to where now, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people will hear this on this podcast. We don't have sponsors or anything like that, but I am now proactively going out of my way to promote eight sleep. See, there you go. And it was just because of that experience. But I'm curious in that instance, because now having experienced that, I look at that and say, well, that was a really great decision on their part. Like they went above and beyond. It wasn't just a replacement. They even like reimbursed me for the entire cost of a mattress I bought three years ago, right? Like they did not have to do that. But as a business owner, I'm just curious from your perspective, how do you know when those types of decisions are the right decisions? Because that seems like, I think it ended up being a smart move on their end, but it's hard to tell, right? Like you don't know what that will lead to. You don't when it happens for the first time but it is all about immersive empathy. And immersive empathy means putting yourself in the shoes of that person, but really trying to understand how they're feeling to a point where, well, if you aren't sure, go talk to them, ask them. Like, that's gonna be some amazing, like it's, it's worth the price of whatever you might need to pay to get that feedback back so that you can not just like replace and help that person, but that so that you can take care of everybody else in the future who might be going through the same problems. And of course, as a company, especially a physical product, you can get to the root of the problem and not have that problem happen again. Oh, hey, thanks to you, we made the material a little bit stronger. And you know, that's, it's gonna be 50% less of a chance for that to happen. So yeah, I mean, you don't know, but I think that common sense also plays a role here too. I mean, I think a lot of us have feel like we lost common sense sometimes. We're getting emails every day from people who are like, well, I get emails every day from people who want to be on my podcast because it has a big reach, but it says like, dear host of Smart Passive Income. It's like, you don't even know my name or is this some automated bot? Like again, they're trying to scale everything. If a person just tried to get to know me and was able to provide value to my audience, then cool, like I'll invite you on the show, no problem. And it's like, you, you just kind of have to empathize and, and, and use common sense and, you know, make mistakes along the way. And as long as you're falling forward, you're still making progress. But I think that where a lot of people fall short, especially online, it's like, ooh, online, I don't have to talk to anybody ever. But actually, the truth is you want to talk to even more people because you want to know exactly how they're feeling. Because if you don't know exactly how they're feeling, you might not write the right kind of copy. You might not be able to get a person to click open on that next email because you just aren't nailing the language. And the way you find that out is you have conversations. And my previous book before Superfans was called Will It Fly? Like half that book was all about how to discover what the problems were of your target audience and learn the language of them so that you can basically just bounce it back to them and they're all gonna feel like, wow, you, you get me, you, you know what I'm going through. It's not hard, it's just, it's just takes some work. 
And when, when you talk about learning the language, what, what, what you mentioned in the book is is being able to articulate that back to your, you know, you know, either your ideal clients, prospects, whoever, but just do it in a way where you're using their words to describe their problems. Right, exactly. And it doesn't mean like, you know, you know, if a client comes in and they're like, yo, what's up, G? Like, can you help me out? You go, yeah, G, I can help. That's not what I'm talking about, right? It's it's more how do they describe what they're going through? And then how might you help them understand that you know that that's true and that you have the problems to solve? Actually, there's a quote by Jay Abraham who said, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, they're gonna automatically assume you have the solution, right? So it reminds me of my wife actually, cause she's a, I talk about this in the book, she's a super fan of the Backstreet Boys. And in my research for this, I went to her as a source as somebody who's a huge fan of something. I mean, so much to a point where she has like a bin of, Burger King bobbleheads of the Backstreet Boys. It's a lot of B words from the 1990s or whatever. Still sealed, right? They're probably worth something. I was asking her, like, how did you like even start to enjoy this band? Like, do you even remember what that was like? She was like, yeah, I have vivid memories of that because when she was 15, she was telling me she had broken up with her boyfriend, uh, or they had a very bad split up, and she was uh, in bed like crying or something. And on the radio, because there was no iPod or Spotify or anything at the time, a song played that she had heard many times before, but this time it hit different. And it hit different because as she was listening to the lyrics, every word was describing everything she was going through in that moment of crisis due to this breakup, right? And so the song was called Quit Playing Games With My Heart by the Backstreet Boys, right? And so if you think about that, it's like, okay, the Backstreet Boys at the time, they were, well, who's their target audience? Girls between the ages of 13 and 18. What happens in a girl's life between the ages of 13 and 18? Well, a lot, right? But also they fall in love and they fall out of love. Okay, cool. How do they describe that? Do they say words like uh, darling love and you know, bless my heart that I found my true one and only no, they say things like, oh my God, he's so cute, or quit playing games with my heart. I mean, they literally took that out of a 16-year-old uh, you know, girl's language book and popped that as a song, and it became a number one hit single, right? And so, like, what is your number one hit single, and what are the lyrics that describe or are in that song? Every company has a different hit song, and every company has a different client base that likely has different lyrics that they could respond to. And, and also, I think it highlights the importance of being omnipresent as well, because you, you don't know if like what day could be the day. We see this play out all the time, just in the legal industry. On any given day, somebody could have something happen in their life or in the life, life of somebody else. And if your messaging is out there consistently, wh you know where they are, wherever they're spending their time, then you have the best chance of being able to reach them, as opposed to, let's say, being a best kept secret or, or something along those lines. So like when you mentioned that song came on the radio at a time where like there was, you know, the break up had happened it's in a way it's it's like well that song was on the radio a lot and it, and then the timing worked out quite well right i mean it almost reminds me of first of all you got to know what your superpowers are as a company or law firm you got to know like what allows you to stand out from everybody else and then you got to share it a bunch of times everywhere as much as possible it's like gary v he says the same dang things every single time i saw a parody video of his the other day and it was so funny because the guy on tiktok yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, he's so so funny. He's great. I was like, yeah, Gary says all this stuff. And that's why it was so funny. Did, did you know that Gary and his team actually commented on that? Oh, did uh, they? On one of those videos and was like, we love it. Respect. <laughs> that's like the ultimate compliment, right? To have like a comedian parody, like all the things. But I think that speaks to the fact that Gary, yes, says the same things over and over again. But that's how we know now what Gary is all about. And so when you need a Gary... You go to Gary because you know what he's all about. If you keep changing the language, if you keep changing your target audience, if you keep changing what it is you say, how in the heck are people gonna just understand that you are that person to help on that certain thing, right? This is why even in a way, you know, niching down sometimes, right? Are you the general law firm that helps everybody or are you specifically people who help people who are over 50 on the sort of second half of their life and they react to things a different way. They're thinking about different things. They're, the language is completely different. Maybe they go through a different set of problems. Maybe they're trying to do things with relation to you know their estate planning and whatnot versus a person who's 20 who's not even thinking about that, but they need a lawyer because they're in the entrepreneurial world and they're looking at creating a startup with shares and investments and angel, like completely different, right? And so when you niche down, the language becomes easier and people are more likely to share you. The riches are in the niches. Pat knows that having a clearly defined audience and creating content that speaks to their pain points is critical to establishing credibility. 
I asked Pat to elaborate on how law firm owners can humanize and differentiate their brands by injecting their personality into the mix. Sure. I mean, I, th- there's a line, obviously, right? Like, for example, on my brand, I, I don't talk about anything political or religious or anything because I can create divisions where and, and those divisions are where people can go and have community and have different things to talk about. That's just not what my brand's about. So I leave that out. But at the same time, I talk about the things that I'm into, right? I talk about the fact that, and I don't know if people can see this right now, maybe not, but behind me, I have all the Star Wars and Back to the Future memorabilia. That Those are the things that I'm a super fan of. And I have them here in the background because that's just a part of who I am. And whether or not a person on the other end is also a fan of those things. I mean, if they are, it's like, yo, this is my guy. Like they're, they're a fan too, cool. But if not, it doesn't matter because that's, again, something they know about me that's interesting and, and different. So you might be thinking, well, okay, well, Pat, okay, you're Back to the Future fan. So what? Like, well, how does this actually help you in business, right? Well, whenever a person sees a DeLorean on the street and they know this about me, this happens at least once every other week. A person will snap a photo of a DeLorean like that just was passing their car or something or that they saw on the side. And they go, Pat, check this out. I saw a DeLorean. I was thinking of you. Or Back to the Future will play on TV and they're, they're like, oh, snap, Pat, check out what I'm watching with my kids right now. And so I am now a part of a conversation in a person's life without having to do anything, almost like inception. I show up in different places because of now what people know about me. People now know during this past year that I've invested a lot of my time into starting a new YouTube channel in the Pokemon space. It's called Deep Pocket Monster. And we're at a point now where 11 months in, we're almost about to hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is really cool. But now the Pokemon sort of nomenclature has gotten into the SPI culture a little bit because it's just something fun on the side that I'm doing. And now it's like in my podcast and people now when they see Pokemon stuff, they're like, hey, Pat, check out like all these cards at Target that I saw. I was just thinking of you. It's like they now know this about me. And when I think about like brands that I followed in the beginning of my journey, there was a guy named Jeremy Shoemaker at shoemoney.com. He was talking about affiliate marketing. And the reason that I got involved in his stuff was because at the time I was big into UFC and he would blog about UFC. Like he would just be like, hey guys, like, you know, there's a, there's a fight tonight. And so, you know, I'm pausing the usual affiliate content to talk about this fight and what I think is going to happen. I was like, that's cool. You know what? People didn't care about that. They just skipped over that, but it was all a part of who Jeremy was and it's what gravitated me toward him. So the best thing I could offer as far as advice is just like embrace your weird, right? Don't force anything. Just be you. Nobody else is like you. And that's a hundred percent the thing that you have over everybody else. Yet, for whatever reason, we try to do something like everybody else versus just truly step into who we are. And over time, you're gonna learn, okay, well, people enjoy and resonate with this, so you lean into it. When I started my business and helping people online, I didn't know I was doing this, but I was becoming seen as like the family guy entrepreneur, right? Not like Peter Griffin family guy, but I was the guy who was talking about starting a business to support my family and you know pay for the Toyota Sienna versus like other people who are like in front of mansions or in their garage with Lamborghinis talking about knowledge. So it's like your audience almost tells you what they enjoy or what they think is unique about you. And then you just kind of lean into that. And it's going to take time for that to happen. But unless you're full of yourself, it's never going to happen. Yeah. And, and I think it's just being willing to be just vulnerable, authentic. There's a chapter where you talk about the, the concept of like opening the factory doors, of kind of letting them into um, like the factory and actually showing transparently what goes on behind the scenes. And and I'm, and I'm curious, like just, you know, if you could elaborate on this, because if I recall, this is years and years ago, this is back in like the Steve Jobs era where one of the iPhones came out and there was like some issue people were having. They were saying they were holding the phone wrong or something with like connectivity. And Apple came out with like this tour video where they like took you behind the scenes of Apple and they showed you how they did all the testing for like connectivity and cellular and everything. And it was just a side that people never saw. I imagine that that was probably, you know, what one of the ideas behind that of transparently sharing how this is done behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, this is where business is headed. And I think people online especially are just tired of being duped, tired of not knowing exactly what's going on. And I think that the more open and transparent you could be about how you do what you do or the experience that you're going to offer somebody, the better. And I remember when that happened, actually. I remember when the Apple sort of unibody for their MacBooks happened and they showed how they were being drilled in the factory. And, you know, in one regard, it's like, wow, that's really cool. Nobody else is doing that. But on another regard, it's like, wow, they're opening up and showing us how they do that. And I think 
you know, a lot of this privacy things, I mean, that makes sense as far as companies and IP and all that stuff. Back in the day during the industrial revolution, everything was private, right? Factories were coming about and they were closed doors except for the workers and the investors. But then somebody had this idea of opening up the factory doors and allowing like families to come in over the weekend to have like a tour of the factory or the brewery tour. I don't know if you've ever been on a brewery tour or a chocolate factory tour, but they're so fascinating and they're so fun because it's almost like when you walk into a Krispy Kreme, right? Or do you just see the counter with the donuts that were already made or you go in there if you've ever been into a Krispy Kreme and there's this, this, these glass walls and you, you literally see the line and the dough being made to the dough being put on the fryer and then the little thing that flips it and you and all the kids are all there pushed up on the glass because it's just like fascinating. And you're like, oh man, that looks amazing. And plus the smells and everything. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, stuff myself silly and then take a nap. But, you know, online, we can do this. We can we can share openly about how we do what we do, the process and the technique. And, and, and I mean, think about Elon Musk. He's literally opening up all the patents for everybody is like, yo, we have nothing to be scared of. Like, here, come, go do this. I mean, we could talk for hours about Tesla and the unique things they're doing and and, and how different it is. But definitely, I mean, to, to bring it back down, I mean, transparency is, is what people are looking for. And I think that when people see that, you know, what, first of all, people want to know what they're going to get before they, you know, spend money on you or they spend time, even more importantly. And so when you can share openly what happens and if you can use even one of your own clients as an example or your own customers as an example of like, hey, here's the journey that we took, you know, Jimmy on when he was going through the same process as you. Let's see exactly what's going to happen. And boom, boom, boom. Okay, cool. Like I'm feeling a little bit more safe, especially in, in the world of law. I would, I would imagine a lot of clients who come in, especially first time are very nervous, you know, lawyers and w all this stuff that's scary, money, versus, hey, let me just tell you exactly what's gonna happen. Like you could probably literally see a person's shoulders go down when you tell them that, right? So probably even more important in, in your space than, than anywhere else. We've, see, we've seen this work out. Um, at the law firm owners that kind of do it behind the scenes or whether they're showing off their team, their culture, what the process looks like for what it's like to, to be a client, like what are the, kind of the steps in the process? I mean, any of that stuff. What what are the limitations like just for things that you would want to show behind the scenes versus perhaps the things you may not want to show? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, you'd want to have common sense if you were, for example, working on really a super secret project, if you will. And, you know, you didn't want that to be sort of leaked or anything like that, you know, the, the, then of course that would make sense to kind of hold back from. And you don't need to share every single bit in part, but I would consider the journey that your client is on and what would make them feel better? What would make them feel more comfortable? What would make them feel secure about the thing that they're about to get involved with? Again, you don't need to be like, okay, here, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sit you in this room. The temperature is gonna be 78 degrees. I'm also gonna feed you a bagel. It's gonna come from Burgers across the street at 24th Avenue. It's like, okay, well, that's, now you're now it just seems forced or too set up. It's just like, hey, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna sit you down, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Here are the questions that I'm gonna ask you in case you wanna think about it ahead of time. And after that, we'll be able to talk and I'll be able to come up with a quote for you. And no worries if you are interested, cool. If not, cool. I wanna make sure it's a win on both sides and we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Do you have any questions? Cool, okay, let's start the session. Boom, and I mean, it's just like, let's just use common sense. And with kind of the, the past two years, COVID, everything like that, a lot of things going virtual or hybrid. Uh, I, I know in the in the book you advocate bringing them together, right? Bringing them together in terms of not just community, but whether it's an event or what have you, just a way to be able to gather everybody. How have you seen this play out, and kind of what's your prediction for how this will play out in the in the coming years? Is it do you think it'll stay virtual hybrid, or do you think we'll gravitate all back to in person? I mean, in person is going to have a huge boom coming out of all this, although, of course, there's new variants and all this other stuff that are keeping us indoors and whatnot. But eventually we'll get to the point where just the floodgates are going to open and people are going to be back in person again. I'm already starting to see some of it, in fact, and people are itching to get together in person. There's just nothing like it. However, you can get close. There's a lot of people now focusing on community online. And there have always been online communities. I mean, back in the the bulletin board days, there were communities and then forums and then now Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups. But I think people now want a more controlled experience, not with algorithms at play and all these other things that could be inserted into those conversations like ads and political commentary and whatnot. Community online, I think hybrid. What we want to do is when things open up is in SPA Pro have live events mixed into these virtual events. And so people can even meet in a smaller scale, more local level. It's just, again, bringing back that small town feel online in a manner that's hopefully gonna make people feel good. As an organization that did both this year, so we did a large scale virtual event earlier this year with about 6,000 people. And then we just recently 
did an in-person event with about 2,500. And leading into the in-person event, people were asking us, they're like, was it going to be hybrid? Uh, is there a virtual option? And we made the decision that no, it would not. It would all be in person and that would alienate certain people that weren't willing to make the trip to Atlanta. But having done both, and they were all, they were basically four months apart. So one was in June, one was in November. And I'll tell you, the in-person event, maybe it was just because we've all been cooped up for so long, was just an explosion of, of energy. And, and even now, weeks later, a month later, it's, we're still getting messages every single day. People left transformed, which was back when we did the first event. So this is our fourth one. But years ago, when we did the first one. If someone told me they got transformed from attending a live event with the community, I would have thought, yeah, you know, look, it was great, but I don't know if it like, did you really change your life? Now, after hearing this enough times, this stuff is actually happening. Like, how, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, for one, I think people are more driven now than ever to get things done in their lives and with great guidance and accessibility to all this information and a community to go with it. I mean, you're getting encouraged, you're getting to see other people who are leading the charge and who are, you know, they hold the machete and are clearing the trail for everybody else behind them. Like, it's now more possible to do anything you want to do, which is which is really amazing. I think it'd be awesome if you know, for these large scale events that you do, it's like, okay, cool. Like we have them during the year, during these times, but in between come into the membership community online and we'll stay connected with each other and we'll like form these little groups. And then what's really cool about that. And I've seen this in other industries is little groups form and, you know, little clicks and whatnot, but then they all come to the event together because, you know, they bring each other and they, they, they've been connected online and they want to see each other in person. Now those great things happen and they come back and bring that energy online and just creates this really cool, amazing feedback loop. So there could be some interesting things there for anybody who runs live events and then wants to have sort of not just like the great height moment of the year and then nothing until, you know, the next year. You can have some stuff in between and that's often, you know, going to keep more people coming back year in and year out. But it's so cool to see transformation happen. And I think that when you combine learning online and from podcasts like this, and then maybe in uh, courses and whatnot, and then taking that and bringing yourself to where other people are who are doing the same thing. I mean, this is the beauty of community. You, you can all support each other, even if a person is more of a lurker, they're still feeling that support from other community members who maybe are a little bit more outspoken because, you know, if it's a community who's there for a similar reason, or they have sh the same values, or they're trying to accomplish the same goals, it's like one person likely has the same question as everybody else. And then if there's a great leader involved to help drive things forward, then it's, it's a match made in heaven and positive vibes all around. While building a large following can have a lot of upside, it can also expose you to unwanted recognition and risk. I asked Pat how to avoid some of the hidden traps that come with building super fans and gaining notoriety. Sure. I think a number of people who are online for the first time and, you know, they create content and they get this huge, massive wave of people who follow them and love them. And, you know, it's different. We don't, experience that in normal everyday life. And so a lot of people don't know how to handle that. Sometimes a person could shell up at that point and just be afraid and it's like, wow, there's way too much happening too fast. I'm gonna shut down. And that could be a very natural reaction. So like the fight or flight, well, that's the flight because it's scary. Your standards are risen because there's now more people and more eyeballs on you. That actually happened in, in my career where the fan base grew so big that I felt like every word on my blog had to be perfect. And because of that, I was publishing what was once once or three times a week to only once a month because I was just so worried about having that level of standard be so high. And eventually I just had to say, you know, screw it. I'm just going to go back to the old days and just write and be me and make mistakes and it's okay. And guess what? That like brought even more people in. People loved hearing from me more consistently. And it was just like the real me again versus all this pressure that was on me. So you can have a lot of pressure on you with all those eyeballs. I know a lot of people who change because of the fame right? It's like, wow, I'm the cool guy now. And I know a lot of people who were once my friends, but when they got big, they were, they're no longer my friends because they just honestly changed. I don't know if it was the fame or the money that tends to do that sometimes with people. So I'd recommend that as you continue to grow to have some, you know, I call them rumble strips, you know, like when you're driving on the road and you maybe are falling asleep and you veer over to the right hand side, there's like these bumps on the road that make a noise with your tires. Like you need to have rumble strips in your life so that when you are veering off course, you can have other people or other signals to help bring you back into the lane that you're supposed to be on. So find your rumble strips. And then also like, just be careful. I think a lot of people who have fans, especially in certain industries, luckily I've never had anything like this happen, but there are some crazy people out there, right? And you hear about these stories from, like there's a guy, his name is Dan, TDM is his uh, screen name and he's a big gamer and he's got tens of millions of subscribers on YouTube and people were showing up at his house. And it was just like, you don't do that. And it's like common sense, but fans can sometimes be crazy. 
what was more crazy was like the parents of these children were driving them to their houses. And I'm like, parents, like, come on. James Charles, another big sort of influencers, if you will, in the TikTok and Instagram space have had similar things happen too. So just be careful if you're shooting video, like don't put your address or anything like that on, you know, if you're shooting, yeah, I know a lot of people who shoot unboxing videos. Well, if you forget to sort of like blur out or scribble out your address, well, then now people know where you live and that's not cool and could be a little dangerous. So just be careful. There's some things like that that could happen. The other thing that happens is when you grow big and you have a lot of fans, there's gonna be a lot of companies and other brands and people who want to take advantage of you or get in front of that audience and might try to make it very convincing for you to do that. So if you build a large audience, companies are gonna reach out and say, hey, I'm gonna pay you tens of thousands of dollars to read this ad or to do a brand sponsorship. And sometimes if you've, not dealt with that before, you might say yes, because yeah, great opportunity. I've never made that kind of money before, but it's also a crappy company who's not gonna treat your audience well. And as soon as that happens, you, you've you sold out and now your audience is not gonna trust you anymore because you are just in this for the money. Always have it for the community, for the people, and your earnings become a byproduct of serving that audience. And so if you are gonna be end, ending up to do any brand deals or anything like that, just make sure the company is legit. You've worked with them, you've used that product, right? Like you wouldn't recommend eight sleep unless you tried it out, right? And and you did and you had even this experience that made it seem like, wow, these guys actually care and go above and beyond if something's wrong. That's awesome. Eight sleep, if you're listening, you should sponsor this podcast, by the way. <laughs> you know, what's, what's, what's so interesting, like they don't know any of this and I have now made it my mission to like to spread the gospel on how amazing this experience was. Like I said, I mean, we're talking about it on the podcast here and all of this only just because they did the right thing and then they went above and beyond. Yeah, do the right thing. That's that's also great advice. So as, as we're as we're starting to wrap up, I'm curious. This is a situation that I've uh, in a lot of the guests that we've had on the podcast over the last couple of years. This comes up. It's, it's, it seems like when you build this cult following and this fan base, that sometimes because you're being so authentic and so transparent, that your super fans will get close to you, or or at least they'll try to get close to you, and then they'll make suggestions and the type of suggestions on how you should run your business, how you should run your organization that may not align with what makes the most sense for the organization long term. Um, what are you know, some of the recommended approaches, you know, what would you say is like, how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, that that's going to happen as well because people feel so tied to the brand. I mean, imagine Star Wars, right. And all like the fans of Star Wars who want to see certain things happen to certain characters, but also get so upset when things happen the way that they didn't expect it, or, you know, they'll, uh, Star Wars will hire a certain director and they're like, no, like they get so upset or they go, you need to hire this director. And then sometimes it happens. Like, it's like really cool what the fans can do. You don't want to ignore them for sure. These are your, this, these are your best people. But at the same time, you don't also want to say yes to everybody's recommendation because that is maybe not what is best for the brand in whole. It may be best for that one single person, but that becomes a starting point for a conversation. And you don't wanna end up like a AT&T U-verse remote control that has a f like 5,000 buttons and you only use like four of them because you've said yes to every feature that this person has asked for in your software or whatever. So one way to help is to have a form or place where these this feedback is, is sort of collected, right? So it might be a form if somebody says like, hey, I have a suggestion or something, you can have like a type form or something online for people to go through. So they're all in one spot and you can start to notice some patterns when you do that. Wow, like 50% of people are asking or saying this thing. I think maybe, okay, let's let's talk about this versus, oh, that's just a one-off, for example. Another thing that I think is great is when you open up specific moments in time to discuss these things. And to never say yes right away, always say, okay, well, we'll look into that because you don't wanna make any snap decisions, obviously, without doing any research or talking about it more, doing you know some, some analysis on it. But we often, at least in SPI Pro, we run town halls. So a town hall would be a live call where anybody who wants to share something or has a suggestion or has feedback can come on and talk to us directly at Team SPI. And that's cool because it's all in one place. We have a certain type of headspace going into that conversation and we can collect that information and then sort of the team meets afterwards to talk about if we need to do anything or if not, maybe not. If we start to see that certain individuals are having problems, for example, then we'll reach out to them individually and try to solve those problems, but not make it a huge deal that it may negatively affect everybody else. So, you know, you kind of have to handle that sometimes on a case by case basis, but sometimes creating spaces or moments or forums or forums for people to sort of collectively share these things could be really useful and a, a great way to protect your time as well. And, and Pat, as we come to a close, this being the, the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? 
Yeah, I mean, think about it uh, from like a football perspective, right? A, a game changing play, right? Could just simply be an interception. It could be a tackle. It could be something small that just kind of interrupts normalcy or the flow of something that maybe wasn't going in the in the direction that you wanted it to go to. So, you know, game changing can be just one maybe small golden nugget that you got from today that changes the flow of how you run your law firm. And so nothing changes unless you are out on the playing field, number one, right? You could be on the sidelines, nothing's ever gonna happen. And number two, you also have to recognize and celebrate those little moments, right? So if you are gonna make a change, if there is, for example, a tackle that stopped a touchdown, then great, celebrate that. Don't just, like we entrepreneurs tend to move so fast and we think like chess, five, 10, 20 steps ahead, Sometimes we forget to celebrate those small little moments and and that is game changing as well. It, it becomes game, you can make a thing game changing by acknowledging it, by celebrating it, and then by actually changing direction. So hopefully you've gotten some game changing advice today from me. I look forward to connecting with all of you in some way, shape or form in the future. And Michael, just thanks again for, for having me. I wanna give a huge thank you to Pat Flynn for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated with me was when Pat said that if you start with the quality, the quantity will come. Provide value to your audience by creating engaging content and memorable experiences. That's the best way to build a brand that can dominate any market. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you can leave a review and share this podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Pat Flynn, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time for the season two finale of the Game Changing Attorney podcast, where we'll be looking back on some of the most enlightening conversations and jaw-dropping moments from this year. I think humility is essential in, in, in a good leader's life because life keeps changing and only those who keep learning are going to be able to stay with it. Right now, Harvard Business Review said last year, that the average shelf life of a bachelor's degree when you graduate from college is only five years. So five years out of college, honestly, anything you probably learned there, you're never gonna apply in your, in your business. Well then, how do I keep growing and sustaining my business? Well, have a, a teachable spirit. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Mm-hmm.